Well, let's pray and we will jump in and get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this new day you've given us. We thank you for your word. We thank you that we have the opportunity to fellowship around it. You've promised a special blessing on this book, and we ask that we would experience that as we go through this course in the upcoming months. Just bless our time together now. May we say as we leave here, it's been good to have come to the house of the Lord. And we thank you for all the good things you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So why don't we just start over here and just give your name and so everybody will know who everybody is. I'm Rachel. Amber is my mom. Joni is my basically aunt. <laughs> my aunt. <laughs> I'm okay. Amber. I'm Jerry by Redfield's daughter. I'm just Joni Craft. <laughs> <laughs> just. Just to us. <laughs> Debbie was a schoolmate. Yes. Oh, okay. Jan Kruger. Hi. Hey, Hi. Bonnie Brockway. I've been here what seven years. Yeah. Six, seven years. I don't remember. <laughs> so it's good. Okay. <laughs> I'm Liz Thompson. Leanne Carr. Debbie Wakeman. Glade Warren. Donna Akers. And I'm Edie Sartor. So, um, I wanted to introduce ourselves to the materials, first of all. Um, did any of you that have just come in um, order the little separate text of Revelation book? You don't need it because the entire text of Revelation is included at the back of the book. But if you're like me, I like having it side by side with the questions. Mm -hmm. Just personal preference. However, if you do decide to order this book, be aware the headings are wrong on a lot of the pages. Oh. I can tell you, I don't know what happened. Somebody didn't do the proofreading. The text is accurate. <laughs> but if you're if Jenna says, you know, okay, now this scene reminds us of one back in chapter four, and you're looking back and it says 19, you know, and you're thinking, what is this? It will frustrate you to death. Yeah. So I will tell you, and I have some dry white out so you can fix it. Or if you want to save yourself even that trouble, uh, there's another outfit called Illus Illuminated Scripture Journal. It's also done on heavy paper, also done with text on one side, blank on the other. Um, you can order that, and in this one, all the headings are correct. But that's just personal preference, okay? Now, the book um, and the handouts. The first handout, the, the top sh big sheet, is called Another Perspective. Um, Basically, that's me, but sometimes if I read other people's comments, I will pull those in if I think those are helpful. The course, of course, is taught by Jen Wilkin, and we'll be listening to her, and I have a transcription of that, but there are just some things that I wanted to share with you, and we've already covered the first one about the standalone copies of Revelation. But this book, this particular workbook that Jen did, has lots of appendices in the back because there are a lot of special features about this book. So I thought, let's just take a minute and get acquainted. If you'll turn to pages 210 and 211, we'll start with those. <clears throat> As you are probably aware, Revelation is a very symbolic book. I mean, from the first chapter to the last, there are symbolic things. Numbers and objects. So on page 210, she gives you the way that numbers are used typically, symbolically in scripture. For example, one is the number of unity. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. But he exists in, guess what, three persons. So three is that number of divine perfection, completeness, totality of God. Um, you've probably seen seven as the number of uh, completion and perfection. And so she will refer to these things as we go through the course. And if you don't happen to remember what some number represents, it's right here for you. That's why it's there. Same way with the symbols. Um, she gives you a lot of the typical symbols. For example, you, Revelation has many, many references to the city of Babylon, which doesn't just stand for a city. It stands for a whole world system that's anti-God. And so she gives you that kind of thing. Um, 
as contrasted with Jerusalem, the new heavenly city, the city of the saints, God's city, God's dwelling place, and so on. Um, so she just gives you things that you're going to encounter in Revelation and some of the symbolic meanings that they have. Um, if you turn to the next page, think, oh my, here's the ten plagues of Egypt. Why is that in a book on Revelation? Well, because many of the plagues described in Revelation reference back or have very close ties with these ten plagues. And you're going to be comparing them. So here they are for you if you don't remember where they are. Here's just a nice little reference point for you in the appendix. The, the next one, attributes of God, Jen always includes this because she always, at the end of every lesson, asks you, what attribute of God really impressed you this week as you were studying? And if you think, hmm, what are some of the attributes of God? Well, here's a nice list that may prompt your memory. <clears throat> Hi, Teresa. Hi, Sari. <laughs> oh, okay. And, Teresa, I did not make enough copies, so I will get a set for you for the notes, okay? Um Okay, so those are the attributes, or many of the attributes of God. And then if you turn the next page, we have a drawing of the tabernacle. Uh, yeah, we're looking at all the appendices in the back of the book. And if you're wondering why the tabernacle, well again, the tabernacle itself is a symbol. And it, it was a picture of some truths that God was communicating down through the century centuries and we're going to be referencing it many times so many times in fact that I have put a little sticky note on there because one of the things Jen asks us to do is when you encounter something in Revelation that relates to this go back and put the verse reference on it so I'm going to pass around these little help yourself to a sticky note you can just slap it right on there <laughs> oh I try to be <laughs> Okay, so those are the appendices. Now, if you were very observant, you may have noticed we skipped over the first one. And I had a reason for that. Let's come back to that. It's on page 209. And if you turn to page 209, you will see a heading that says, Four Views of Revelation. And then a little explanation under that that says, Here's a brief explanation of the most common methods for interpreting the book. Most common? You mean there's more? There's four? Well, how do you know which one's right? You know, what are we going to do? Well, um, we don't want to be nervous about that. <laughs> In fact, we shouldn't even be surprised by it. If we have a book that we've just said is filled with symbols from the first chapter to the last shouldn't surprise us that there might be different ways of looking at those things. And the other thing is, um, we need to, what I want us to do is spend time, we'll look at the last part of that guiding principle, um, starting in the middle of that. Does that make you nervous? We shouldn't be surprised that a book filled with symbols from the first chapter to the last would be open to a variety of interpretations. I purposely skipped over this for the time being because, ladies, we need to spend time examining the text and seeing what does Revelation say before we try to decide, now which one of these camps am I going to jump into or do I think I fit into? The other thing is, next paragraph, we also need to acknowledge that we may not all reach the same conclusion. Does that make you feel a little uh, uneasy? Well, the Bible addresses the fact that believers will not always agree on what is the right viewpoint on certain issues. Now, there's some things we absolutely insist on. Jesus Christ is God come in the flesh. He died. His body died. He rose bodily. There are people out there that don't believe those things. Mm -hmm. We say you must believe those things if you want to be a follower, a true follower of Christ. But is it okay to wash dishes on Sunday? 
You know? Some people may feel very strongly no. Some people may feel just as strongly, of course. Which is right. Well, the truth is, they may both be right depending on what's right for that person. And so Paul addresses one issue sort of like that in Romans 14, 5, and he says, one man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. I have a little Bible help that my husband introduced me to. It's a New Testament called the Discovery Bible New Testament, and it, ha it incorporates a lot of features of the original Greek so that you can kind of see. And one of the things it does is tells you what, ver what words in a particular verse get the most emphasis. And so I've uh, put that Romans 14.5, the way the Discovery Bible renders it, let each man be fully convinced in his own mind. Um, and the tense of that Greek verb, be fully convinced, means that this is to be an ongoing habit of our lives. When we have an issue that comes up, we need to study it out for ourselves and be convinced what do we feel the Holy Spirit wants us to do about this. We need to be fully convinced in our own mind. As Jen Wilkin has said in the past, we need to love God with our mind, not somebody else's mind. Okay, so that's my goal. So my hope is that you won't set a goal of determining which of the four views in that appendix is the right one, but that your goal will be to study the text of Revelation diligently, carefully, develop your understanding of God's word so that you'll be able to reach your own conclusions, so that you'll be able to articulate those conclusions and be able to give good reasons why you either agree or disagree with other viewpoints as you encounter them. That's my goal for us in this class. So with that goal in mind, we're going to start with the first three verses. In fact, that's all that Jen is going to cover. Can you imagine the first three verses? She will pick up the pace. But um, I've printed the first two verses at the bottom of this white sheet. Um, and you'll notice, so let's just read it. The revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, whatever he saw. You notice there's some words that are underlined. What's underlined? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. What else? God. God. Well, angel and John. This is giving a progression of how this revelation came. Where did it originate? And be careful, it's a little tricky. From God. From God the Father. It originated with God the Father, who gave it to Jesus Christ, who sent an angel to his servant John, who wrote it down so that we could get it, and other people. There's a progression there. Um, and uh, if we turn the page then to the next page, let's look at the first sentence again as rendered by this Discovery Bible so we can learn something from the emphasis given in the Greek. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God, God the Father, gave it to him. And this is a pattern that we see over and over and over again in Scripture that God the Father has a plan in mind. Jesus Christ faithfully carries out that plan, and he does so by involving both men and angels at various times to accomplish it. Example, remember back when uh, Sodom and Gomorrah were getting so evil that finally God came down to deal with it, and so he and the two angels are going along with Abraham in that direction, and God says, well, should I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? With the implied answer, no, of course not. He's my servant. I will tell him what I'm about to do. Think ahead a few hundred years. Moses, 
I have heard the outcry of your people there in Egypt, and I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to send you, and this and this and this and this is going to happen, and Pharaoh is going to just get harder and harder and harder, and then I'm going to do this. God told him exactly what was going to happen, and it all happened exactly the way he said it. Pastor Mark, this past week, was talking about this very thing. Jesus Christ was talking to his disciples. He's about to leave to be crucified. And he says, look, I'm telling you these things now so that when they do happen, your faith will increase. You can believe because I told you exactly what. This is a pattern of God. God the Father has a plan. Jesus Christ carries it out. Jesus Christ in the garden. Father, if possible, can you take this cup from me? Nevertheless, not my will, but your will. I will faithfully carry it out. And then he involves angels and men who also are faithful. When they gave this revelation to John, he faithfully recorded it. God continues to use his servants today. His servant, Jen Wilkin, will faithfully ask us to do some things. Um, and that brings us to the third verse here, which I have in front of you. It says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it, or who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what is written, because the time is near. And so Jen, because of here's a blessing that's promised from God, every week at the beginning of the week, she will ask us to read aloud the portion of Revelation we're going to be studying that week. You can do it in a variety of ways. If you feel comfortable, read it to your family. Um, Tom and I have decided that we're going to read a chapter a day together. And we read it aloud. I read half, he reads half. Uh, this kind of fulfills one of his goals. Uh, if you were here last January and he preached that uh, he was challenged years ago to every day meditate on some aspect of Christ's death and some aspect of his resurrection and coming again. So this reading Revelation has kind of helped him fulfill that goal in his life and it's helping me fulfill it. If you're shy about reading in front of other people, then read it aloud to God. You know, somewhere in a private place in your home. Anyway, Jen faithfully asks us because God says, blessed are those who do that. And then, blessed are those who keep it. She also faithfully will ask us at the end of the week, what did you hear this week? What really impressed itself upon your heart this week? And how are you going to keep that? So, um, and coming to the last paragraph, the displays and pictures. So we have... The Apostle John is faithful to record it. Jen is faithful to ask us questions about it. <laughs> and I, too, want to do everything that I can to help you hear and heed and keep what you've heard. You're going to see pictures and verses displayed on the walls, things that I hope will continually send a subliminal message, even if we don't consciously think about them. And one of them is this right here. I went through this entire course this summer in preparation for leading, and what I heard, what really impressed me from this book, is that God is on the throne. He's perfectly calm. He's perfectly in control. He is bringing his plan to perfect fulfillment at exactly the right time. And I want to keep that thought literally in front of us. That picture is going to stay right up there for the duration of the course. God is on his throne and in control. Um, you also see this verse. This display will change basically from week to week. Um, I want to bring in things that I hope will be a help to you. It's a very visual book, so we're going to have some visuals to maybe help us visualize it in our minds. So, that's what's in store.